So now we will move on to our third speaker. Our third speaker is Keith Barr. Uh, really a pleasure to introduce Keith. He's a professor at the University of California, Davis, uh, known really uh, internationally for his work on tendon training um, uh, and biology. Uh, he heads the Functional Molecular Biology Laboratory there at UC Davis and, uh, and works with a lot of elite athletes. So Keith, looking forward to your talk. All right, so I wanted to first thank the organizers, thank Clara, thank Bob for having me involved here. Um, so this is the regenerative and rehabilitative. Because our work in the regenerative capacity, as far as the cells that we're using, is, is more in the developmental stage, I'm going to talk about the rehabilitative component. And, and I'm really just going to really work to emphasize what, what Bob was saying there. So, so what, first, uh, again, I'm going to have to disclose things. I work in sport nutrition, so a lot of, and I work at UC Davis, the center for food science in the world, so a lot of nutritional companies work with me. So if I say anything, again, those are all the things that you don't have to believe. Um, on that big diagram that Jen showed earlier about all the things that were super exciting about this meeting, it didn't say 10 in once. It didn't say 10 in once, and that was a little bit disconcerting to those of us who study tendon. So what my job is to tell you why this is important, the first reason is that 75% of the reason that your athlete, your favorite athlete is out of performance, is not performing for your team right now, is probably because of a tendon-related injury. And for those of you who study cardiovascular function, say, oh, tendons, I can actually decrease the rate of cardiovascular effects, so cardiovascular disease, by 50% if I have your tendons and ligaments and all of your components of your musculoskeletal system working right, because then you're going to be able to do the movements that are going to keep you healthy. So I then focus on basketball because, well, there might be some bias in the room. So this, the reason we're focusing on basketball, they say 50% of all basketball players at elite level are going to say that, oh, yeah, I've got a little bit of niggling here and there. Um, you, can tell, you can talk to the people who, who do this professionally. They're on this side of the room that I noticed. But only 20% say they reported, oh, yeah, decreased performance. But if you actually go in an image at the bottom here, 75% of players in the NBA or at high level of basketball show degenerative problems within their knee. And that's within, with an MRI, but that's problematic because the MRI is not really good at, ca at catching this. And so we have to get a lot better at imaging. Um, what, what my title is was a little bit about imaging, but that's because of what we're doing. The only thing that I'm saying here is this is the same in all sports. It's actually the same with my dad, who I just was visiting in Toronto for his health because he can't move around because he's got musculoskeletal pain. So all of those things doesn't, doesn't matter when you're trying to perform or whether you're just trying to do what I did 20 minutes ago, which is to run and repark my car so I didn't get a ticket. That performance requires that I have a working musculoskeletal system. All right? So it's important. So how do we image? A lot of what we do is we'll do a T2 MRI, and we'll say, oh, yeah, there is, there is something, say, right over here. You can see that this is an NBA player. This is at the combine. You can see that little white thing there, the kind of blackish stuff on the other side. Hopefully that's projecting. That's what we call a donut. And when we started in the field, the world experts were saying, Focus on the donut, not the hole, because we can't do anything with the hole. Well, I'm Canadian. We have Tim Hortons, and so <laughs> Tim Hortons is famous for their Timbits, which is the donut hole. So my goal was then to, to fill in the hole. All right. If you have a really good technician, you can, you can also do this by ultrasound. So you can see here, this is an elite discus thrower from New Zealand. This is the ultrasound, so this is his patellar tendon. You can see the edge of the patella here. You can see that's a hole, because there's not anything there. The second thing you should see is there's almost no good patellar tendon here. And so this is kind of what you get as far as knees. The reason we get this structure is because of the mechanics of that tissue. And it's really, really important because when we're talking about putting in orthobiologics, the mechanics of the structures that we're working in are going to make it really difficult. The other thing is that everybody will tell me, because it's said in your, in your textbook, that a tendon connects muscle to bone. That was the end of it. No more discussion. Because the idea was that this is an inert object within your body that doesn't turn over. And you'll hear these great things like the half-life of collagen is 102 years within your body. OK, great. So unless I'm going to be 204, I'm not going to get much turnover with my patellar tendon and my quadricep. But this is from Luke Van Loon in, in uh, Sorry, not in Copenhagen. He's in Holland. 
He's in Maastricht. Everybody says that muscle is really dynamic. There's a muscle. This is the protein turnover rate within a muscle. So if we go over, we say, oh, there's cartilage. Cartilage never turns over. We just heard that. But it actually turns over at the same rate as skeletal muscle, even though we say skeletal muscle is a highly dynamic tissue. How about ligaments? There's the anterior cruciate ligament. Oh, it's almost twice what you see in a tendon, uh, within a muscle. Does loading matter? There's the posterior cruciate ligament that doesn't get loaded. Now it's half of what you saw in the loaded tendon. That patellar tendon where I showed you that hole, look, it's actually more dynamic than skeletal muscle. So this is not an inert tissue, even though Michael Kerr has done beautiful work using the bomb pulse to say that the central core of a tendon stays the same from when you're 17. So there's a disparity there. It just means that it's dynamic, but it doesn't change the way that all of your other tissues do. So how do we model this? And so Danielle Steffen, who's here, she's, she's one of the early Wusai uh, fellows. She uh, came up with this model where you take a healthy, healthy rat patellar tendon, we put a central core tendinopathy into it. Sorry about the gruesome picture there, but this is what a normal tendon looks like. This is an extreme case of our tendinopathy, and you can see that there's a big hole in it, just like that MRI of that professional basketball player I showed you. So it's a perfect model. She then went through, did all the genetics. The genetics are almost exactly the same between the rat patellar tendon issue that we put in and the human, human tendinopathy that we see. Now what we can do is we can go through and do all kinds of cool stuff. So one of the coolest things that she's doing is spatial transcriptomics. For those of you who don't know how to orient here, this here is a normal tendon. You can actually see that there's a population of cells on the outside. That's your peritenon cells. Those have your stem cells within the tissue. And this is going to be the tendon proper. Then you can see the injured tendon. You can see, oh, there's the injury right there. And it means that in this case, what we're seeing is that this is a little bit of the patella here. That's the bone. Oh, that area in the middle, that actually looks a lot more similar to the bone. We don't see this all the time, but this is now the data that we've got that we can then start looking to say, how does load affect this? What happens when we see in the process of tendinopathy? And she's got, she's got tendons that look perfectly normal by histology, but when you look at the genetics of the cells that are there, they still show dramatic differences. So even when we're imaging, we're going to see things that are different on the, imaging, on, on the images than we should. So why do we see that central bit that looks more like a bone than looks like a tendon. Well, this is, this is basically showing that when we have cells and we put them under tension, you get a lot of things that you would see in tendon. When we put them under compression, you get a lot of things that you would see in cartilage. With a central core in injury, like a patellar tendon or a jumper's knee, what you get is the outside collagen stays strong. And as you pull on it, it actually compresses the rest of the tissue. So what you can see is in a normal jumping athlete, as you pull on this tendon, tendon is going to keep the same volume. And as it does that, I don't load these out. I don't load the little injured area. And that's why you get what's called a scar. What a scar is, small collagen, non-directionally oriented. So that's supposed to be this thing that, oh, it's the injury. Well, actually, we think it's the unloading. So what can we do? Well, we can use the mechanical properties of this tissue, of this tendon, and we can go through what's called stress relaxation. So what I can do is, if this tendon is super strong, it's going to stress shield the injured part. You're not going to get any load through the injured part. But one of the properties, and everybody in the room knows this because you've had some sadistic gym teacher who's made you do wall sits, and you put your, your legs and your knees at 90 degree angle and you go into pain. Why should that be painful? I'm not doing anything. What's happening is your, your tendon is relaxing. So your muscle has to work harder and harder to keep you in that position. That's this process of stress relaxation. If I do an isometric contraction for about 30 seconds and hold that, the tension of the healthy part decreases so that I can get tension through the injured part. And what does that do? That allows us to go through and, and actually fix tendon problems, fix the donut, fix the hole, not the donut. And so what we do here, this is our NBA basketball player. You can see there's the hole. This is 12 months later. You can see there's no hole in that patellar tendon anymore. This is 18 months later, no hole there. That seems to take a long time. That 18 months, that's a long time. So what I did is I put this one in there for you because this is the ultrasound. There you can see the hole. You can see this weak looking patellar tendon. That's an elite athlete who's, who qualifies for the Olympics. But he's, you can see there's almost no patellar tendon there. 50 days later, again, it's a highly dynamic tissue. Hole is almost completely gone. This patellar tendon now is significantly bigger and stronger. So this is a highly dynamic tissue. And it becomes really, really important because I was flying back yesterday, so turn on the TV on the airplane, I see LeBron James come out in a boot. Okay, that's really bad. 
because this is a highly dynamic tissue. Why is this really bad? So this is a study that, that Danielle and I did two weeks ago. So basically all we did was took a rat, stuck it into an Eppendorf tube so that it couldn't move. So we put a rat in a boot. Now we've immobilized it. We did it for the weekend, so it's three days. What happened? 10% loss in muscle mass over that. 20% loss in tendon collagen within three days. And the, this is second harmonic generation imaging that, that the Smith lab next to us did. You can see beautiful collagen, aligned collagen here. Immobilization, three days, it looks horrible. We've produced tendinopathy in three days without actually injuring the animal at all. Okay, so this is why the dynamic component of the rehabilitation part is gonna be super important for this. All right, so take home messages that are there. I think I'm under 10 seconds here. So, so basically we do a lot of things with stress relaxation to get tensional load between the, to get it the load onto the injured part. And for these mechanical tissues like cartilage, bone, tendon, muscle, being able to feel, sense that tension is absolutely essential to what their functionality is. And so if you cut that off for three days, my friend Luke in Maastricht has done this in people, he puts them into a knee brace, Five days later, they've lost 5% of their muscle mass. That's two kilos of muscle in five days. For him to regenerate that, eight to 12 weeks. So when I see LeBron James come out in a little boot, well, for, for Clara, that's good, but for, for LeBron, that's bad. Okay, so um, with that, I'll thank uh, all the people who do the work, Danielle especially, um, Alec Avey, who's, who's probably the world's best um, tendon or ligament engineer. Uh, he's engineered more ligaments, and that'll be for the next time we talk. Um, lots of people who help as far as on, the, on both the, the practical and the, and, the, and the applied side of this. And I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions later.